Welcome to another Box Score Geek show. Uh, this week we'll be talking rookies, Batman versus Superman, and Kobe versus Michael. Which one is more ridiculous? All right. Um, I'm Andres Alvarez, a.k.a. Nerd Numbers, and with me, as always, is the voice of God, our producer, Brian Foster, who you can find on Twitter as Box Score Brian. Uh, say hey, Brian. Hey everybody, Dre here, just keeping you in the loop as to what happened. So for those of you watching the video show, this will be like a director's commentary. And for those of you listening to the podcast, this will just be a very awkward cut. At this point, I started to uh, banter with Brian back and forth. It's something I've started doing more on the show uh, and definitely been enjoying it. Brian is the producer, so he usually keeps his mic muted to the live stream. I can hear him, uh, but you can't. So when I call him to ask him a question or to talk back and forth, he has to unmute himself. It didn't happen here, so uh, growing pains and something we'll try and do better about in the future. But with that said, back to the show. All right. So anyway, every week we do a poll on the show. And last week, our poll had to do with the 76ers. So... They just managed to stave off starting the season 0-18. and And as we had mentioned in last week's show, the all-time losing streak record in the NBA is 26, who the Sixers were well on their way to. And the good news, though, is because they managed to get their win in the season early, there was still a chance for them to get back to it. So that was our poll last week. We asked you, do you think the 76ers can get back to 26 losses in a row? And you were actually pretty optimistic about the Sixers' ability to be pretty bad, although it looks like that trended up a little towards the end of the week when they did happen to get their second win against the New York Nets, the New York Knicks. So we'll have to see. Although another thing that happened, we mentioned they were only led by three really good players, and that was a stretch. By good, we meant average. Alexei Shved was one of them, and he is out indefinitely with injury. So... You know, 76ers, you have a great chance at being in the lottery again. Actually, uh, on last week's show, I have a lot to discuss because last week's show, we we said a lot of big things, and we actually got some of the most comments we've gotten in a while uh, on a show. Um, And by the way, we've mentioned a lot about moving the show, et cetera. And uh, we we will still, as I mentioned, be putting the notes up on Box Score Geeks. But nothing personal because we do have a lot of great commenters. But anytime I say something serious, I, I... am pretty much just satisfied with my kind of general take on comment sections, which I'm not actually that big of a fan of them. So anyway, last week we did a pretty big topic where we talked about Ferguson with Charles Barkley. And I I wanted to touch on this a little because what I'll basically say is there's an interesting dichotomy on this topic. And the first is we brought up racism in the United States. And I feel this is one of those issues that is not really complicated in the sense of knowing that it's there. The United States does have a race problem. One of the things you're going to hear me talk some more about this show, too, as well as like video games in the tech industry are sexist. I don't feel that that it's complicated, um, outrageous, outspoken to say any of these things. And I kind of get annoyed at the pushback. On the other hand, what I'll say is all of these issues have a lot of minutia involved in them. There's so many things. There's socioeconomic issues, how police treat people. Uh, government funding, things like slavery do have an impact, Uh, regulation. I saw a really interesting TED Talk that made the note that when we look at our drug control laws, it really has more to do with the group that was using the drugs and if people were against them at the time and less to do with any sort of, you know, public health issue. So with that and with that said, you know, there is a lot of really complicated historical stuff that goes into these issues, racism, sexism, et cetera. And what I'll find is people will jump into these minutia and argue them vehemently to try and disprove the first thing I said, which is a simple premise. There are race problems in the United States. Uh, and that always just kind of kind of bugs me. And yeah, that's that's all I'll basically say is, you know, when I when I was talking about uh, racism in the United States and kind of the outrage at Ferguson and kind of the outrage at what, you know, what I will call the whitewashing of various subjects such as rioting. Uh, I get annoyed when people hop into those as if say, no, no, see, there's not a race issue that that never really flies. I will actually give a shout out, uh, to cracked. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and get the person's name, right. But it's uh Christie is the first name. They have multiple Christie's at the site. That's why I'm, I'm, uh, stalling for a second here but christy harrison did a post uh on eric garner and ferguson 
And what I loved is, is she has her first subject in this uh, article. Sorry, Brian, I didn't give it to you. But if you look it up quickly, it's called Ferguson Eric Garner and Why Death Should Outrage Us. Her very first bullet point was shut up about riots, white people. And one of the things she brought up, the best example, I didn't even realize this, is that there was a riot when Joe Paterno was fired. So just, you know, proves my point. We'll look at the outrage over rioting in Ferguson versus the outrage at that. And it's just not held at the same level. I'm not condoning either or is what I'm stressing. I'm just stressing that we have a very narrow lens that we will often view certain people through and hold them to higher or lower standards based on our biases. And there's also a great cracked article up today about racism. So that's what I'll say on, on that for now. Um, yeah, uh, just, it was big enough in the comment section that I figured I'd at least touch on it again. Oh, uh, we've been mentioning this a lot, but you know, after last week's show, Brian actually did talk. So we are actually going to be moving to the Nerd Numbers show on January 1st of next year. Um, decision we made. Uh, and just to kind of give some feedback on it, basically, as you may have noticed, I post a heck of a lot less at the Box Score Geeks. I haven't really developed anything, you know, because one of the key things at the site is tools, et cetera. And I've been really interested in doing more audio video stuff like podcast, video editing. And Brian was a big part of that. Uh, and my brother's a film editor, and I'm excited about that as well. And basically, I just kind of want to take that in my own direction. And I, you know, want it associated with the Box Score Geek site, but just have a lot of plans on my own for directions to take that and, and want it to be kind of its own thing. So it's very clear that it's on its own uh, and just kind of under my control. And, you know, one of the things that started is when we started the Wages of Wins podcast way back in the day, we did really do more of the, you know, just friends kind of uh, shooting the breeze once a week. Uh, and I am actually kind of interested in pushing some of the polish and things we can do with the show going forward. And again, Brian, as I mentioned to you, you're a big part of that because you hopped in and you're like, hey, I can do templates. We can do intro videos. We can do all this other stuff. So that's kind of the direction I want to go. And that's you know kind of why I'm making its own thing. I got a few questions last week when I was mentioning that. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. And as I mentioned, we've given ourselves a harsh uh, a harsh, I guess it is harsh, a hard deadline of January 1st. So expect that to happen starting next year. Uh, got any thoughts on that, Brian? Otherwise, I can uh, start moving into this week's topics. Not too many. And I think this is actually my first real time talking on the show after the audio issues earlier. But um, no, it's going to be fun. I, too, joined this because I'm really interested in NBA tools and all that. And um that will continue, but at the same time, we love talking about pop culture and other stuff, so whenever those comments come, uh, stick to basketball, you guys. Well, now we actually have an excuse. Our show is about other stuff, too. So well, I forgot fun. that that was a hilarious comment that said you guys should stick to sports, and I, I, I love my retort, I'll actually say, uh, for last week's show. I was like, yeah, I'd love to, if even if we just stick to sports, Ferguson and Eric Garner, you know, uh, you know, the uh, Derek Rose wearing the I can't breathe T-shirt, you know, so it's like if you say just stick to sports. It's like, yeah, sorry, it's it's there, too. So with that in mind, let's actually get to sports. So something that's going to happen in the very near future, if it hasn't already by the time the show comes out, is Kobe Bryant will surpass Michael Jordan on the all time NBA scoring list. Interesting. And, and what I should stress, of course, is that Kobe Bryant is only really going to pass Michael Jordan in the sense that he has taken many, many more shots and has had a longer career. Uh, as we may remember, Michael Jordan, his second season was injured, the, you know, most of it. He took a two year hiatus to go try his hand at baseball. Uh, he retired for a bit before coming back with the Wizards, where he managed to play even worse than Kobe is playing this season. And yes, don't let the big numbers fool you. Kobe Bryant is indeed not playing well this season. I'm just going to try and get this up in front of me real quick, Brian. But this season, Kobe Bryant's wins per 48 is negative 0 0.33, uh, which is a points over par of negative 4.1 per 48, which means basically if Kobe played the whole game, it's like spotting the opponent four points. And of course, he is shooting the highest if not best he has in many many years at 34.6 points per 48 but he is shooting worse than Allen Iverson was during his heyday so that should tell you about it so one thing I did Brian is I made a 
a chart, and I decided to compare it to baseball. And interestingly enough, I didn't get the answer I wanted in baseball. I kind of got the same interesting trend. Is I looked at the top 10 scorers in NBA history, uh, which does include Kobe, and I looked at the top 10 hits leaders in baseball history, and I just did a quick comparison of, in baseball's cases, at bats versus hits, and in NBA cases, what I called true shots versus points. A true shot is one shot per every field goal attempt and 0.44 shots per every free throw because not every free throw ends the possession. And what we basically see is the two best scorers in NBA history are Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Karl Malone. And if we compare their true shots versus points, there's a very big discrepancy. Uh, bringing up next is Michael Jordan, who, again, took far fewer true shots than points. He's at 28,396 true shots versus 32,292 points. And then we actually have this really weird territory, which is Kobe Bryant and Wilt Chamberlain, where Kobe Bryant, with almost 1,000 more true shots than Michael Jordan, has managed to get almost as many points as Michael Jordan. That's a pretty big discrepancy. One thing I'll say about Wilt Chamberlain, there's two parts. In Wilt Chamberlain's era, the notion of shooting effectively was just kind of foreign. Wilt Chamberlain and Oscar Robertson were kind of the first two players to kind of burst through with this notion of, hey, you can shoot efficiently as well as taking lots of shots. And the other thing, of course, to mention about Wilt Chamberlain is his free throws were horrendous. He had like a 54% effective field goal percentage, which is great. He's one of the few players who gets a worse true shooting percentage than effective field goal percentage because his, his free throws were just that bad. Another player I kind of want to bring attention to is Shaquille O'Neal, who is fifth on the list, and he was just amazing. Uh, if we look, you know, he was basically as efficient as Michael Jordan in regards to points versus uh, shots, and he too just falls prey for the free throw problem. If, if, if Shaquille O'Neal had managed to just shoot even average from free throw at you know as a normal center, he would have had over 30,000 points in his career. And the one player I want to give you is Elvin Hayes, who is just the one player on the all-time scoring list who was just horrendously inefficient and just took lots of shots. It was a product of his era, but geez, uh, that's all I can say there. Another note I want to give Kobe is, is I mentioned something called like Jeter syndrome is what I wanted to call it. And I definitely think Kobe Bryant falls in that range, which is if you play your entire career with one franchise, win some titles, the franchise will basically forgive you. And Derek Jeter is another, you know, we're looking at baseball, one of these players that has, uh, he is on the all-time hits list, but that is because he just got so many at-bats. Uh, to be fair, on this list, the player that beats him before is Hank Aaron. So, you know, geez, when it comes to knocking down names. And this Ty Cobb fellow, who may have been a horrible racist and a horrible person, was apparently really good at hitting uh, in his heyday. So that's all I really have to say at the moment. One other note I'll give is Dirk Nowitzki is on this list of all-time scores. He is the only player on the list currently that's actually good at three-point shooting. It really seems to be, and this shouldn't be a surprise in the NBA, that the all-time scores, except for Car oh, not Carl Malone, except for Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, are all big men. And you know the NBA really is built for that. It is built for big men scoring in the paint. But Dirk Nowitzki is the most versatile scorer on the list, actually being good from three. Uh, but so all I'll kind of end that on is when Kobe does pass Michael Jordan, and I doubt he'll catch Carl Malone and certainly won't catch Kareem, uh, we just have to keep in mind that, you know, basically he's shooting kind of the same as players were shooting in the 60s, and there's not that much impressive about that. Uh, and, you know, rings or not, he's certainly not on Michael Jordan's level. Uh, anything to add to that, Brian? Now, I'm just looking over this chart here, and it's really cool. Um, so these are the highest scores of all time, right? I'm just wondering, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. Did you look at anyone else that maybe was a little bit lower down on the list that maybe was particularly efficient or inefficient? I'd be interested to know, out of the so-called uh, all-time greats. Well, so, I mean, one thing to consider first off, because I mentioned Dirk Nowitzki being the most versatile, is Larry Bird was one of the greatest shooters ever and one, you know, was great at scoring. And his real issue, though was that he had to deal with injuries and ended up, you know, retiring early. So he didn't make it as high, um, you know, right below, and I mentioned this, Oscar Robertson is actually 11th. Oscar Robertson is impressive in the same vein that I said, is that he was kind of the 
the coming of you know a new player that was actually scoring efficiently when the NBA was full of inefficient scores. Right below him is Dominique Wilkins, and I'd put Dominique Wilkins in you know kind of the same Kobe category. You know, takes a lot of shots, but was never that really efficient. I'm going to try and look at his uh, true shooting. Yeah, his true shooting at 53.6 percent, nothing uh, that impressive. And the only other active player um, that's really close at this point is Kevin Garnett. And, you know, obviously I don't think he's really going to climb uh, just because of his uh, degradation. He'd have to score over 10,000 points to, you know, climb another list. But in his heyday, he was darn impressive. He's the big ticket for a reason. Is that a nickname? I, I, think I apologize so. <laughs> for not knowing as well. I was, you know, Minnesota is the place where great players go to not be great. And actually, that's been a story I've been meaning or a topic I've been meaning to put, which was the Kevin Garnett Award, which, you know, I was going to say is awarded to the player that plays at the highest level with the least support. And obviously, Minnesota was the king of this award for a while between both Kevin Garnett and Kevin Love. So, yeah, if he was the big ticket in his heyday in Minnesota, all I'll say is, man, they really need to give him some more help. And obviously the current recipient of that award would be Anthony Davis, who despite a stat I threw out this week is, um, if we look at players in the NBA this season that have 25 points, 10 rebounds, 2 blocks, and 2 steals, Anthony Davis has 7 games at that level. The rest of the NBA combined, all other players have 3. So Anthony wow. Davis this season... Just freaking impressive. And uh, will be the recipient of this year's Kevin Garnett Award for me if I ever get around to writing that post. We're going to have to do a deep dive into the Browse stats at some point this season. He's just amazing. I will, I will say everybody keeps bringing up Per, and it really depresses me. But the one advantage is Per, per would actually be a good stat if everybody just shot really efficiently. And Anthony Davis is shooting freakishly efficiently. So Per, you know, that that's the point is if you didn't care about shooting efficiency – in wins produced, you you could get something like per, and that's you know many people will say wins produced overrates rebounds. Wins produced counts rebounds the exact same as per. The big difference is per doesn't really care about misses. So if you don't care about misses, um, Anthony Davis looks just as good as he actually is because he's not missing. So that that is the ridiculous part. Now with that in mind, and, and one kind of thing I. I about the show is basically, you know, we are primarily a stat show, but I do, you know, talk about other stuff. And so something I wrote about this week at Nerd Numbers, I'm, I'm currently at about a blog post a month at the nerdnumbers.com site, but I actually wrote about Batman versus Superman. I wanted to bring it up and I can actually tie it back into sports, which is I called the, the post, no, Batman wouldn't win a fight with anyone, just stop. And so obviously the upcoming uh, Zack Snyder uh, Superman movie is going to be Superman versus Batman. And this is just the stupidest, 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 stupidest. I think I'll do one more stupidest, stupidest fight you could have. Batman is not taking Superman. It's just not happening. No. I'm going to give a spoiler. That is going to be this week's poll, and I'm going to be snarky on it. So even if there is a Batman option, it's going to be a, you are you sure? Did you misclick here or something like that? Uh, and what I'll kind of say is the way this ties into sports is sports has all of these narratives about chemistry and leadership and wanting it more. And while there may be a glimmer of truth to some of that, you know, to leadership, to chemistry, to people getting along, et cetera, these narratives just do not hold up to reality when, you know, one of the things I was talking about today is Carmelo Anthony on Twitter. I basically said, Carmelo Anthony Calling him a selfish player is interesting because he does actually pass the ball more than an average small forward and is actually more efficient than an average small forward. Carmelo Anthony's problem isn't that he's selfish. Carmelo Anthony's problem isn't that he's not a good player. His problem is he's just not as good as his contract and the hype would have you believe. And the problem people, I think, have is we, we want to have this narrative that if Melo just tried harder, he could be a better player. And I don't know if that's true. I, I, I think just in sports, you have teams and players that are just way better. And it doesn't matter how much you want it, how hard you try, how great your leadership is. You're just not going to you know beat the big three uh, in Boston when they're all healthy, the big three in Miami when they're all healthy, the big three um, on Chicago when they're all healthy. So... I do think that narrative gets in front of just, you know, obviously logical stuff when you're like, could the 76ers beat the um, Miami Heat in the finals? And you just go, no, that's that's just no, that's that's silly. That's a stupid narrative. 
that's gotten away from you. And I would argue the Batman versus Superman issue is kind of like that. It's a stupid narrative that has gotten away from people and they want to tell those to themselves. They want to convince themselves of all these things. But Batman is really smart, but he's rich, but he's the ultimate detective. But Superman, and the answer is just no. And I feel sports is like this sometimes too, where we're going to want to try and explain why Kobe Bryant is anywhere near to Michael Jordan's level. And the answer is just stop. No, there's no level of narrative that's going to put them on the same stage. Uh, I'm sorry. So that's all I really got. Uh, I did just want to promote it on the show because, you know, I was I was happy with it and thought it related a little. And I figured the tie into sports is, come on, that narrative is just silly. Just, just stop it. And uh, just to do a quick check on you, Brian, to see if I fire you as producer, where do you fall on the Batman versus Superman scale? Well, you're going to have to convince me a little bit, Dre. Let's get into the details here. Let's break oh, this so you down. actually want to go over that? I, I figured I was just going to give a brief shout out in the middle kind of a commercial. But, okay, so so my basic points on Batman versus, I, I did Batman versus anybody, but Batman versus Superman. My my four kind of tenets are that it's people It's like why say, Batman's crappy, basically, right? Yeah, I guess that would be another title. That's what I'm seeing here. But what I saw, people will say Batman is super smart. Batman has advanced technology. Kind of related to the technology is Batman is rich, is his power. And and Batman knows everybody's weaknesses are the the four major reasons I kind of gave that people bring up all the time. And in the super smart, you know, even Superman, all we have to look at is Superman's nemesis is Lex Luthor. And Lex Luthor is essentially Batman. Lex Luthor is just super rich super intelligent, and Superman beats him on a regular basis. Uh, and then you can just kind of look at other villains, in, in fact, like I brought up Brainiac. There are people in the DC universe whose power is legitimately to be super smart. Batman may be smart, but compared to these other people, he just doesn't stack up. And the other thing I'll bring up is there are many times that Batman in a story will outsmart a, a hero or villain. And when you actually look at that hero or villain, you're like, actually, that wasn't that intelligent. The comparison I brought was the Princess Bride, where I said, Andre the Giant's character reveals really quickly that he could have just won the fight. So for those of you who haven't seen Princess Bride, great movie. Uh, our protagonist, Wesley, comes around the corner and is almost hit in the head with a rock. And Andre the Giant basically says, look, I can just kill you right now. I can throw a rock at your head and kill you. Or we can fight one-on-one, -on -one, which is the only way Wesley manages to win. And he kind of just does that because of honor or whatever. And that was kind of the point is it's like Wesley doesn't have a legitimate shot in that fight unless the other character is intentionally unintelligent. And so Batman well, I, has the power of pity is really what you're saying here. That is a good one. I could actually give it to you that way. So, I mean, that's what kind of happens, right, is when, when the other person is outsmarted by Batman and you're like, ah, they, you, just, you just let him win, didn't you? you? You felt bad for the guy in the bat suit. Uh, the advanced technology, what I kind of brought up is that if we look at the DC universe, you know, Superman's got crystals that can build cities. Uh, the Green Lantern has this powerful ring that can, you know, do anything except affect the color yellow or wood back in the day. So a number two pencil is uh, Green Lantern's ultimate weakness. Uh, the Flash actually has this like little ring that holds his costume in it. So there's so much advanced technology in the DC universe or even mythical, right? Wonder Woman's got her uh, bracelets and uh, Lariat of Truth. You know, there is so much impressive technology, either magical or man-made, in this universe that the fact that Batman has these kind of DOD toys that he's allowed to play with just doesn't really give him an edge because th this technology exists in that universe already. And there are, in fact, secret labs like Cadmus. There are people like Lex Luthor working technology. So that technology doesn't even give him a leg up. And even more crazy is in the, the example I gave, this does actually tie back to the NBA, is there's a character in the DC universe named Steel who just made a super-powered suit that lets him fly, that makes him invulnerable, that has, like, various weapons on it named Steel. And he kind of, in this, if you read the comics, he did this, like, in an afternoon. It was actually turned into a horrible, horrible, horrible live-action movie starring none other than Shaquille O'Neal. So that's my basic point, is technology isn't an edge. And even money, Batman's company is supposed to be a defense contracting company that sells to the government, and yet apparently Batman keeps all the great gadgets for himself. So that doesn't even make sense in universe. And even knowing the weaknesses, the point I made there is every single weakness that Batman knows about a hero, such as kryptonite to Superman, applies to him. If Superman is, is uh, weak against a radioactive substance, well, Batman's weak against radioactive substance. Batman's weak against fire, like Martian Manhunter. 
all of these weaknesses that Batman knows he has himself. So he doesn't really get a leg up. If anything, he's even footing before getting knocked back. And my final just point about Batman is I basically just said Batman is the Wesley Crusher of the DC Universe. The authors are in love with him. That's why he wins all the time. Realistically, Batman doesn't win a fight with anybody. All right, that's a little bit convincing, but um, I guess I'll bit. just oh, say come that. come on. Come on. All right. You know, guys like Superman and even Andre the Giant, for that matter, they have something going against them on these narratives. The big guy is always dumb. And he's unnecessarily dumb, so I don't know. Well, that was that is one thing I actually liked about the Princess Bride. Think about it is like Andre the Giant isn't dumb. Like even in his character, he's supposed to be unintelligent, right? And that even then, he's like, by the way, I realize this is stupid. I realize I could have just thrown a rock at you and won. So that that's all I'll say. The only way these people win in these stories is because the author is on their side. They're not super smart. They're not super talented. Their technology isn't better. The only, only, only thing they have going for them is the authors are on their side. That's one thing about the box score geeks, Dre. They should stick to basketball. No, I'm kidding. That was oh, really fun. Oh, I like this segment right, a lot. All right. I like that. I, it, it, is, it is bad that like it's, it's, it's wrong encouragement because I don't really like trolling or negative comments. But when you get such a hilarious negative comment that you just want to repeat it, it's just bad reinforcement to the commenters. Because I don't actually want you saying stuff like that, people. But that one stick to basketball was hilarious. Or we'll edit this part out. No, we'll leave, we, we'll leave it in. It's fine. <laughs> All right. So last one, Patrick uh, did a check-in on the rookies of the year. And I didn't have a good segue, so apologies. So we're going to end with talking about rookies. So Patrick did a good post about, you know, kind of who would be rookie of the year right now. Uh, and, you know, obviously the only really impressive one at this point, and by, by impressive, I mean playing lots of minutes and playing at a top level right now, uh, is Jabari Parker, which is just kind of crazy when you think about it. For what it's worth, and I want to stress this, we know predicting rookies is difficult. And if you look at us, if you go back to the box score geeks when we graded the draft, we actually thought, uh, according to our Turo's model, we thought Jabari Parker was a C. We basically said, you know, he might have some potential, but we didn't think he was a great draft pick. We didn't think he was a lottery pick. So with that in mind, he is currently the best rookie um, if we're looking at total wins. We do have a couple of players, and that we, we should maybe note that Houston seems to be drinking the San Antonio Kool-Aid uh, with uh, Tarek Black, and I know I'm going to mess this up, but uh, Kostas Papa, Papa Nikolau. Nikolau. Yeah. You got oh, it. Oh, uh, by the way, shout out. I don't know if this comment was deleted, uh, but I was saying Giannis Atentacumpo incorrectly. I was saying the first name wrong. I was adding a G. So uh, just to stress that, uh, yeah, I was messing up names. The commenter who corrected me, thank you. That was after I was bragging up being able to say his name correctly, too. Uh, but yeah, we basically have a few really impressive rookies on Houston that we're noticing basically because of all the injuries. We have a few other players that are playing at great levels, um, you know, Nikolai Mira, uh, Miratik and uh, James Enos. But, you know, of course, they're not playing full minutes. And then you have Jabari Parker, who's, you know, arguably the best rookie if, when you factor in minutes as well. And you couldn't see it coming. What I want to kind of stress about rookies in general, we were talking about this little pre-show, Brian, is that it's just really hard to know which rookies are going to be good and which rookies are going to be bad. And something I kind of noticed when I kind of started going back through history of, of recent drafts is you don't really ever find a rookie that's going to play at star level in more than 2,000 minutes in their rookie season. Uh, the last two to really do it, by the way, uh, were Landry Fields and uh, Jamario Moon. And the sad part about both of these rookies, which brings in another factor, is they both ended up kind of getting injured and, and never really amounting to much. I, you know, I don't know if uh, Landry Fields will ever really make a bounce back. So the idea when teams kind of put their hopes and dreams in the hands of rookies is to just note we don't really see rookies come into the league and just make an immediate impact. And even some of those that seem really promising, things can derail their career. So uh, – giving a shout out to Dave Barry again when he was talking about the Philadelphia 76ers is rookies and rookie deals are a long-term solution. You're hoping they grow into someone that's going to help your team out. 
they're really not going to make an immediate impact. If they do make an immediate impact, it has to be in kind of a controlled environment like the Spurs, where you have a really good team for them to come into, and you're not going to overwhelm them and expect too much of them. But it is just a note, uh, and what I really liked about Patrick, uh, and I'm going to see if I can get the quote from him, but he ends his post when he's talking about it. He goes, I remember all last year there were a lot of folks that were dead certain that this draft would be the one for the ages. Right over there with 1984, 1996, and 2003, I wonder if they're still dead certain. And if so, I wonder where their certainty comes from. And so his point, right, is we're seeing some good rookies, but we're not seeing this amazing just plethora. In fact, currently, uh, according to his chart that he had out, there are only six rookies that are playing above average. And of those six rookies, really only two of them are getting starters minutes. So I kind of agree there is, you know, whenever you see people that are utterly certain a draft is going to be really, really great, just be trepidatious. And to know we're not ever going to see a deep draft like the 1984 draft, 1985 draft again because of the one and done rule. Because there is now just so much uncertainty in any rookie that basically – you're just going to get lucky if you get a Chris Paul, and it does appear to be that Chris Paul is a once a decade, if that kind of prospect to get. That's what I got on rookies, Brian. Curious if you have anything more to add. Um, I mean, I wasn't that surprised by the yeah. check-in. Always fun to give, but it is just the some rookies are playing good. We didn't see all of them coming, and no rookie is really going to make an impact on a playoff team. No, there's one thing that you touched on briefly that maybe you could expand about that we talk about a lot, which is sort of the value of draft picks and um, why we say these high picks, the first through third, are a little bit overrated and why stockpiling picks is better. Because it's kind of a subtle thing, right? We always say draft picks are good, but then we say, ah, you shouldn't tank to get the top three. So, Yeah, I mean, it, this is totally a quantity over quality kind of thing. I don't think you have the ability with individual draft picks to hit a player with the certainty you would like. So, I mean, with, with that note, like, you know, we love the Spurs for Kawhi Leonard. And, you know, that that worked out. And we've had lots of this, but we've also seen people like, I mean, it's worth noting Mike Be- Michael Beasley was one of the top draft picks. You know, he looked like the next Kevin Durant. We look at where Kevin Durant is now, and you think about that, right? You go, Michael Beasley looked as good as Kevin Durant, and you compare where those two have ended up. I mean, that, that should just tell you right there the signal to noise kind of ratio is if you're hoping that a draft pick is going to hit even once every three times, well, you might be disappointed in that because at about what we've said, and I don't want to say 40% meaning hit rate. I want to say 40% meaning Dave Barry has said 40% of the variation in your play in the NBA can be explained by your college stats. That means a ton of what ends up happening with you can't be explained by your college stats. So if you're even just hoping to hit one and three on, on draft picks, well, you might be disappointed because just the odds are such that it's entirely possible for you to miss on all three. So, yeah, what we're saying is rookie contracts are gold. You, you, can't, overplay any, you can't overpay anybody on a rookie contract. We're, we're saying you, there's lots of inefficiencies in how teams draft, so you have an edge if you draft correctly. But what we're not saying is try and get the top three pick because you you don't even have an idea if you get the top three pick that they're going to amount to anything. And, you know, for every great pick that was picked in the top three that turned out to be great, a la, you know, Kevin Durant, it's easy enough to name at, without even thinking hard one. And when you actually go through the data, many, many more players that don't live up to it. So, for example, Kevin Durant, I can list Michael Beasley and Greg Oden as just two players that didn't turn out, you know. Dwight Howard, a great number one uh, high school pick that, you know, became a great player. Kwame Brown, you know, it's it's not that hard to basically just note how easy it is to fail in the draft. Nice. Thanks for that. <laughs> That's right, what I was so, looking for. So, you know, with that in mind, I think, you know, I don't know if we've gone 30 minutes or however long we've gone, but, you know, we're hitting the end of the show and I'm not that mad because actually this shout out section, I have a lot to say. So actually, I'll let you do your shout out first, Brian, because my shout out's going to be a little more somber. Uh, and your shout out, we're, we, we're, do we have a rerun? And do you want to explain what happened last week? Oh, yeah. Quick shout out. So, um, yeah, of course, we're iterating the show, getting it ready for next year and all kinds of stuff going on. So, yeah, I was muted during my shout out last week, but we did get to see it on screen a little bit. And just very briefly, uh, I ran to my good friend Dan Stryker in the grocery store. He told me I needed to do more shout-outs on the show, so I shouted him out. I showed a great link to his uh, graphic design and illustration page. So, yeah, 
it was fun and thanks for watching the show dan we appreciate it okay so and that's dan hyphen striker spelled with a y dot com graphic designer illustrator all around great friend and you know i just love that you know you 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 give him a shout he says you need to shout out more and you shot you mess up the shout out for him which is just hilarious well the mind is uh, stronger than the flesh sometimes dre okay so my shout out mind is stronger than I guess that is a quote, isn't it? Anyway, sorry. It's a um, butchering of an axiom, I believe. So what's the actual axiom? Do you know off the top of your head? It's the, something What close is it? The mind that. is strong, the flesh is weak or something? I something like that. Is. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll throw it in the, uh, the notes if I'm feeling like it. And if not, you know, you'll just, you, dear listener, will know that we said it and messed it up. We work in the tech world. We'll iterate these axioms. Oh God! Uh, we, you know, it, it may not ever be a sports show, but it, you know, I don't know if you'd ever be down for this, but I would be okay doing a tech podcast where we just talk about all the stupid phrases. I like won't spoil start- anything, but there may be some uh, show unrelated to us that's a Silicon Valley tech show coming up in the future. So maybe we can shout that out in the coming months. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, you know about it. I'll remind you after the show. Oh, okay. And yeah, I was just gonna say, like, you know, startup mentality and. Uh, disruptive and there are all these phrases that are just so associated with tech and i'm not gonna lie even though i'm in the field some of them just drive me crazy i wouldn't actually mind having a show you know back and forth and you know the iterate you know just you know don't make it good just iterate as a as a popular one how could we make jokes without all this jargon though i guess that is true you know dilbert wouldn't have a place to go uh now on that note uh tech field i'm going to give a shout out to shanley who you can find on twitter as at shanley and you can find her site at model-view-culture.com. Uh, and I'm going to give a link in the thing to one of her collection of essays called Your Startup is Broken, which you can purchase for $9.99. Um, she recently did a, an, a great interview with the MIT Tech Review. And I'm not actually going to link that because what ended up happening right after she did this is I'm going to avoid saying any names, but a profile of her was done by a well-known misogynist and harasser in the tech circle. And then unfortunately, the editor of the MIT Tech Review basically tweeted that out. And this made me really sad for a lot of reasons. So I'm going to go off a little here. So uh, Shanley is a well-known feminist uh, person in tech that does a lot of speaking about problems in the tech sphere. Uh, And she's considered outspoken and Basically, as far as I can tell, the only reason is that she cusses a lot and is kind of, and you know, people will call that rude. And what kind of bugs me about this, if we look at the history of tech, is some of the most lionized figures in tech, people like um, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, these people have been well known for being rude and, you know, for treating people abrasively. You know, Steve Jobs was known when he first started Apple to, you know, come in barefooted, put his feet on the table and ask inappropriate interview questions of, of potential candidates. So it doesn't really do a lot for me in the tech space when the only argument you have against someone is they're rude. And I will really say it does come off more sexist in this field, in the realm that you're basically saying women aren't supposed to speak like that. Um, it's also just kind of depressing in general to notice how, and this doesn't just happen in the tech space. Brian and I were talking a little bit about this pre-show, but whenever an issue comes up in the news, one of the things that just drives me nuts about common reporting is this belief that you have to make it seem fair and balanced. Isn't that Fox's stupid expression? But the idea is if someone brings up an issue, you have to have people from both sides of the issue speak to consider it, you know, to, to make it seem like you're being unbiased when the reality is there are many, many issues where both sides of just the argument aren't necessarily even. And then there are many, many times where, you know, the speakers you get, both of them aren't anywhere close. And, you know, the one I'll give you, for instance, Dave Barry has dealt with this a lot when it comes to sports because Dave, for instance, you know, PhD in economics, multiple, you know, I, I always use the quote 40 plus, I think he'll look 50 in the very near future, 40 plus papers published on sports economics and peer-reviewed journals, et cetera. And you kind of get like a blogger uh, as your counter, as your contrapositive to having the argument. And the fact that people treat these similar drives me nuts. And it's the same thing here in tech where, you know, I'm a huge fan of Shanley's, all of the stuff she's done. And it depresses me when the editor of the MIT Tech Review will basically bring up a horrible person as a counter, you know, as a counter agent, say they both have good points. And 
frankly, I'm, you know, I, right after this interview was posted, uh, I followed the MIT Tech Review. I was really excited. And then I unfollowed them a day later um, because, and this is one of those issues, like I was talking about racism, and you're not going to get anywhere with me. The way females are treated on in tech in particular and sports as well, but even just on the internet, it is not the same. It, it really isn't. I, there was one article I ended up writing, which was the 25 player, players better than Kobe. And the reason I wrote this article is I was ranting on Twitter, as I'm prone to do, about how Kobe Bryant was overrated. And I actually struck a nerve. Like one of my tweets got picked up and a bunch of people saw it and got upset with me. And I actually, this was one of the few cases where I actually got like a death threat and, you know, was called some racist nicknames. Uh, and I think rape came up. I'm not 100% sure. The fact that I have to think about it should show that it's not really an issue in my mentions at all for me. And I was really angry at that. And I was like, well, I'm going to turn this into a piece. But the point is that is the worst harassment I've ever faced. And I've been posting for four years. I'm considered outspoken. I'm considered outrageous by some, even though, you know, I consider myself the nerdy guy who just looks at the numbers. So I can't consider that too outrageous. And the fact of the matter is my treatment on the Internet is nothing like what I've just noticed for normal females in tech and female in sports. So the treatment is way different. And then when people kind of get upset when they respond to this and basically say we're treated differently, this is unacceptable and kind of go very diminutive and say you shouldn't be talking like that, it does strike a nerve. So, again, MIT Tech Review, I'm really sad that you let me down that quickly. Uh, Shanley, amazing. Uh, I'll put a link to her book that you can go buy. Uh, definitely a must follow. And it's just something that matters to me in tech. And one of the reasons I'll say I have a slightly outside perspective. I consider myself very privileged, very well off. I don't consider myself an underdog in the slightest. I want that 100% clear. But as you may notice by both my name and if you're watching the live show appearance, I am a minority in the tech field. And it turns out Hispanics are very, very underrepresented in the tech sphere. And all it takes is being slightly outside of the norm, being slightly outside of that 20 to 30 year old white male to just realize um, the issues with diversity in tech and the treatment of those people, uh, myself included in this case. And that's all I'm saying is that when people talk about it, it shouldn't be viewed as the worst thing ever. And I noticed that happen a lot, which is why, you know, Shanley, great follow, follow, you know, follow her. She says great stuff about it. And frankly, if you're watching this show and you tell me you have a problem with cursing or people seeming rude, then I just question how you can watch watch sports on a regular basis. So that's what I got. Um, as I mentioned, Brian, I love the regular season because I don't even have to worry about what we're going to post next week because I guarantee you there will be a story that comes up. Although, based on some of your um, comments to me and some of just the rumblings in the Wages of Wins group, I may actually talk, uh, retouch on Clay Thompson, who is a fascinating topic. And actually, I think that would just be a fun topic to do for a show. We, we talk about Clay a lot, but you know, why stop there? We've been riding the Clay bandwagon his entire career. I say we should just stick on it. So that's what I got. Any final thoughts, Brian? No, I got no final thoughts. Great show this week, and I had a lot of fun. I can't wait for next week. Sounds good. So we will see you next week. <laughs>